just realized we're in Texas time here. Yeah. Can we change that? Is that going to confuse people? <laughs> no, I was like, wait, we have a whole other hour. You guys are here an hour early. <laughs> <laughs> Excited. Lots of exciting in the crowd. Yeah, we can go until uh, 3 o'clock, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, sure. Okay, and guess what? So it's 12.30 in Texas, that means 1.30 in DC. So welcome to the 10th, uh, I didn't want to say annual, but it's not annual, International Symposium on Visualization of Transportation. Uh, I'm Michael Shade, I'm with CAT Lab, that's at the University of Maryland, it's the Center for Advanced Transportation Technology. Um, and we have a bonus, I don't know if you looked at the schedule, uh, we actually have a bonus person, so if you thought you were getting only two presentations today, you're in luck, because we have a third. Uh, the name of the session is Keep on Trucking, and apparently that is a Grateful Dead reference. I remember the t-shirt, but not the song. So if anyone wants to sing it as a bonus fourth presentation, let's hear it. <laughs> um, and it's all about freight vis visualization. So our first speaker is Nicole Katsikidis. <laughs> Woo! Um, let's see, she is a research scientist and project manager for the Texas A&M Transportation Institute, that's TTI, prior to TTI. She worked for the Maryland Department of Transportation, and I believe she still does. Uh, she was, correct? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Serving as deputy director for their State Highway Office of Planning and Preliminary Engineering, and so many other roles. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, a broad range of experience here. Thank you very much, Nicole, for joining us, and you're up first. Okay, hi everyone, uh, thank you for coming to this session. I'm real excited to talk to you about some of the things that we've been doing uh, for freight visualization. Uh, before we get started with any of these presentations, I just kind of want to tell you about my frame of reference or how these things came to be. Um, maybe not so much the ones that Dave is going to talk about, but those two. Um, I came from a DOT. I used to be Maryland's director of freight and then came to Federal Highway and was the freight performance program manager for a while and then went back to Maryland and then to TTI. And why that's important is I know what it's like to be at a Department of Transportation. I know what it's like to be a very busy DOT staff person who um, is having to juggle, you know, one day the hot new thing is transit oriented development, the next day the hot new thing is truck parking. And I know what it's like to have to work with elected officials and to get something in front of them when you only have a split second and to get them to care about something when you only have a split second. Um, I also know what it's like when you need to get information and you can't get it or maybe you have the data in 20 different places but you don't have it easily at your fingertips and then you have to pay a bunch of consultants to go out, no offense to all our consultant friends, you have to pay them to get the, to put together and sometimes it's just not efficient and a lot of times, especially at a DOT, um, I know there's a lot of money flowing around lately especially for freight and different things that are coming out but a lot of times it, that you know, you have to make a decision whether you're going to spend on one thing or another, and sometimes you just don't have it. So what we've tried to do with the tools that I'm going to talk to you about today is really make it easy for DOTs to put their data together um, in a cost-effective fashion. You know, this, this here that I'm going to show you today, it's not rocket science. It's not super, super expensive at all. Um, it's uh, very cost-effective, very efficient, and uh, it puts things together f uh, so that you can, as a DOT person, and I know not all of you represent DOTs or MPOs or local governments, or even uh, the federal government for that matter, but they need resources that they can tap quickly and uh, that are also defensible, and it's really important that they can get to that. So. Um, you're going to hear a lot about different resources that are, are great um, uh, to this, during this conference, and um, I'm excited to see all the rest of them. So these are just a few that I think uh, work really well to help tell the freight story and give DOT people the visualizations that they need um, in order to get in front of leadership or stakeholders and to get people to care, because let's face it. I geek out about freight because I've been involved in freight planning and policy and operations for a very long time in my career. But um, a lot of people, sometimes when I talk about freight, I had a DOT person I was meeting with yesterday just say, I am glazing over, Nicole, <laughs> um, because they like other things, and, that, and that's okay. But freight is very multifaceted, and you need a way to simplify it. The first thing I'm going to talk to you about is the freight fluidity tool that we made for Texas Department of Transportation. You might have heard the term freight fluidity. It gets bounced around a lot. I think sometimes people are, use it interchangeably with supply chain fluidity, and that's not 
correct, um, but freight fluidity is a concept that TTI helped develop with Transport Canada back in the 2000s. And the idea or the concept of freight fluidity is I want to understand what businesses experience. I can see all traffic, but I want to see those links, those ships coming into the port, those, then the cargo gets on a train, and then it gets on a truck, and it ends up at a certain destination. I want to see that point A to point B trip experience, different commodities. What, what are different businesses experience on my network? I want to have that kind of intel so I can better plan for uh, how to help them or better prioritize the network to help them. And I will say to you uh, that Transport Canada, this worked out so well for them because they have uh, a lot of capabilities that we don't in the United States to use data and to protect data, whereas um, the government here, if you know, that's one, been one of the challenges with visualizing multimodal freight is that uh, once you give it to the public sector, it's hard to protect. Uh, and some things like especially rail data are proprietary. But in Transport Canada, because they've been able to get this level of freight fluidity, and I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent a little bit, but I think it's important. Because they've had this ability to, uh, to do this freight fluidity analytics, they've been able to identify opportunities and lure business from other countries. And I think I read an article not too long ago that it had brought them over $10 billion in, in economic value uh, by uh, using these types of analytics. So if you think about that and you think about if we can get creative and get to ways here in the United States where we can get close, um, there's really a lot of opportunity to use visualization to bridge transportation planners with economic developers and to um, do a lot for the American economy. So freight fluidity, like I said, and, and all that is really that business perspective. Like as a, at a DOT, you can see all the things happening on your network from an all traffic perspective. But what if you're um, a, the gravel industry? Or what if you're uh, the petroleum industry? What do you care about? And what does your route look like? And how healthy is it? What kind of delays are you stuck in? And um, uh, what kind of jobs are tied to those delays? What kind of economic impact is that? And if we prioritize the segment of the road on your route, would that help save or grow jobs? Uh, so there's lots of questions that can come out of looking at this. Uh, I kind of went through these slides already because I, I just really like to talk about all this stuff. But you know, free fluidity matters. I'll just say a few things. When goods can't move efficiently, it can impact uh, the economy. And the example that I'm giving you today, we're going to talk about Texas. And then understanding freight fluidity, like I said, it links transportation and economic development. It helps transportation planners understand what's, you know, the economic impacts uh, and where they might be able to support economic development or growth by investing in the system or sustaining a particular business that's important to the region because they invested in the system. And it's important to understand what goods are moving on the system and have that level of intel. And it aligns with a lot of the freight planning goals that many states and MPOs have, and in particular in Texas, uh, they have identified economic competitiveness, mobility, multimodal connectivity, and customer service in their freight plan. So what freight fluidity can do, what visualizing it can do, we can create an awareness of freight movement or business supply chains. We can understand the position of a state, particularly in this case, Texas, in, uh, to understand, uh, to help them with uh, identifying opportunities for sustainable funding through defensible information on supply chains and the transportation components of supply chains. We can support identifying bottlenecks and solutions that are going to best help business. And one, I think a key thing I forgot to mention is that I remember being at Maryland DOT about 10 years ago, and one of the um, when someone in leadership was like, "Why well, aren't all freight bottlenecks like if we just look at all bottlenecks, aren't we capturing all the freight?" And what um, Dave has found, and what we've consistently seen by looking at freight bottlenecks uh, differently than all traffic bottlenecks is that that's a different experience. And um, it's not the same. And by uh, looking at things or prioritizing roadway bottlenecks by looking at them all together without having the freight lens doesn't do you any good. It's a different experience, and it's worth separating out. Um, it can help engage freight stakeholders. Uh, when your stakeholders, whether it's the industry folks 
or the public or elected officials, when they can see something, I think you all here are here for it because you're in, interested in visualization, and you all know when you can see it and absorb it, it goes way farther than a PDF report, and when you can interact with it even more so. It helps identify uh, the opportunities for partnership, and it can improve operations. So this is not just a planning tool. It can help uh, those in operations say, okay, I know this corridor is really important for a particular commodity, and if we don't get it back working or if we don't you know, take care of some sort of um, incident, this is going to impact this industry, and we might have, uh, just as, as an example, for example, um, when I used to be the freight director, we managed a short line railroad on the eastern shore, a hurricane of Maryland. A hurricane came through and washed out the railroad, and um, uh, because of that, that was going to mean 800 trucks descending on the small town, creating a huge problem on the eastern shore. So. Um, if you have to have that level of awareness, and if you can see and you know the types of, and so therefore that commodity that they were moving, which was grain for Purdue at Chicken Agribusiness, um, if you can see the commodity and you can see where the issues are and you, can, uh, and you have this kind of intel, you might be able to think of solutions that are going to help those industries to be resilient. And I know that's a, a real important thing that we've been talking about a lot is um, resiliency of our supply chains. And so that's where this information can really help. I will get to the tool in a second here, just bear with me. I did want to let you know that there's a lot of, we've been, we at TTI um, and our partners in Maryland and Texas and a little bit, um, a couple projects with Federal Highway, we've been trying to get to that level of Transport Canada fluidity by doing different things and using the data the best way we can. So there's a lot of detail out there, information out there. If you're interested, I can connect you to the previous work. In Maryland, we've looked at uh, key supply chains in and out of the port and looked at the transportation components and identified trips and looked at what's moving the bottlenecks and given them some intel that they've been able to use um, in their f considering freight. The bottom graphic is the Port of Baltimore, so we were able to marry um, Army Corps AIS data with the uh, highway data to look at that port to highway connection and give that kind of intel to the state DOT. Um, this other example here is Maryland. We've used the data in Texas to look at uh, travel time sheds for particular uh, business areas and, and between freight generators. And so this intel has really laid the groundwork for what I'm going to show you today. So what we've done to get to Texas's freight fluidity tool is we said, okay, how can we really make this interactive and get them the information that they can use to look at their corridors and understand what's moving, how much, how much is it worth, and where are the bottlenecks? And then once we do that, can we put on any other types of measures like multimodal links or a business impact measure or resiliency measures? And what I have to show you today is the first part of this work that we're doing, and probably when we meet again, we'll be able to show you uh, some of the latter part of what I said. But we have taken uh, data sets of TransSearch that TxDOT had, which includes information on commodities, tonnage and value, and some other uh, detail. And we've been able to conflate it with or, or you know, marry it up to um, performance information uh, using the INRIX data that Texas has available, so the Texas uh, bottlenecks uh, and the performance information. And we created this tool, and what it's, and so this is the zoomed out view, and I'll actually show you the tool in a second, but I just want to say that it puts the congestion data on the Texas highway network, which, so this is on the actual uh, highway performance monitoring system network, and that's the official a state roadway network, and that's important because anything else that's on that network, uh, such as pavement quality or other information, can be eventually added to this type of information, and you can see things in a robust way. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about the Maryland Roadway Performance Tool where we're doing that. We have a suite of all kinds of measures and things that are in HPMS that help them look at bottlenecks in relation to everything from CO2 to um, uh, pavement quality and commodity value and so forth. So this shows commodity, like I said, by type, tonnage, and value in relation to performance, and it allows people to be interactive. Um, let me actually just go to the tool. I wasn't sure if we would. That's I'm going to show you later. 
So here's the tool, and if you go to it, you can go to the old information that I talked about for Texas, um, some of the uh, travel shed, uh, the preliminary fluidity information. But here, um, it's kind of in this like 3D sort of version. You can change the way you want to look at it. It's got an opportunity to change the settings. I have it set such that, and it's a little hard to see zoomed out like this, but the the color of the road, so where you see red, that's a bottleneck, and the height is set to tonnage. So for all commodities in Texas, based on TransSearch, this is what the commodity flows look like. And so uh, this provides, at a glance, all tonnage by truck and truck delay. So you can see where the bottlenecks are. And it's not surprising, and I kind of live close to this area, that uh, right here, if you zoom in to Austin, you can see you know, the red, and then the lighter color, which shows this is a huge problem all through uh, this particular corridor. But you can hover over different segments, and you can get different views of this. Let me see. Um, you can get different views, and you can hover over particular segments and get the information down at the bottom where it says root ID, and you can get the commodity tons. You can get all of the actual detail. Uh, so you know what those commodities look like. We're working on a feature where you can select the corridor that you want, like the particular segments you want, and then it'll just spit out that information for that particular part, which can be really useful in planning. But you can change the different commodities. So in, right now in here, we have different things. So um, if I pick on cottons and grains, so this helps to, and it might take a second to load, but this helps to see the different types of, so let me zoom out a little bit here. This helps to see the difference, um, and I don't have my, there we go. Uh, you can zoom around the state, and you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can get different views like that. Uh, but this helps to see at a glance kind of the differences. So you can choose tonnage and value, so I can switch it back to tonnage, and you can see how it changes. So in this case, um, value for cottons and grains is um, a lot higher on some of the corridors than it seems, um, and there, we're not comparing apples to apples here, but you get a sense of what the tonnage looks like in relation to all the commodities if I set it back. And then, like for example, energy, here's another one. So that, um, those, those transportation segments of the supply chain look a lot different. So you can see those corridors that are important for that particular commodity or those businesses, and you can work with them uh, and have those types of discussions with them. You can, and I'll show you a few other of them. Uh, so automobiles. Uh, but what this does, and I think the feedback that we've gotten from the um, Department of Transportation is this really helps them to see at a glance the magnitude of, the, of what's moving on their network by the type of business. And so while it doesn't go down to like this is Tesla or this is Ford or this is uh, Dell, um, they know, and that's one of the things that we're adding is kind of some points of reference. They know where these business hubs are and then we can use this to see uh, how those trips are looking like. We can at least get a sense of the corridors by the types of commodities that are most uh, critical for them. So uh, that's, the, that's pretty much what I wanted to show you for the freight fluidity tool. And I, um, you know, it's pretty simple. Um, this was put together by you know, the, the biggest uh, hurdle was uh, meshing the data together, um, but that was done um, fairly easily. Uh, DOT, if they have good data scientists, could probably do it themselves. And then we put this into Microsoft Azure. And uh, it wasn't, you know, and it, it's not terribly fancy, but it works for them. And they can get the information that they need. And if they want to change, you know, the way that it looks or the color schemes, they can do that. Um, and it gives, or, or switch, if they wanted to have highway performances, the bar height or the uh, roadways, um, or if they wanted to swap the color and the height, you can do that as well. So with that, that's what I wanted to show you for visualizing freight fluidity. And, and like I said, we're working on adding in multimodal so that as we build this out, probably by February, this tool will have um, some of the 
airport and intermodal and port locations in here. So you'll see the links and you'll be able to get performance information for those links to give you that multimodal picture. We'll also be um, adding in resiliency measures. So you'll be able to click and add some resiliency components or understand how resilient the network is in relation to different commodities. So that's going to be able to tell you, OK, this commodity um, suffers from having poor resiliency. When, and resiliency is like when the network is out or there's an incident or a crash or there's congestion, how well does the network recover? So all right. Uh, do you want me to? Sorry. OK. Do you want me to move on to the next one, the truck parking tool well, or, you or questions? questions first? Sure, I can do questions. So any questions? Yes. Um, right now, we don't have it directional, but I think we can make it directional in TransSearch. Commodity data here would not be, yeah. obviously, the spot on the road, but the uh, congestion data underneath it can be done directionally. Yeah. Thanks. And we can continuing to try to explore the directionality and the stuff that we're doing for Maryland, we added the directionality in there. So um, we're trying to explore how to get that more directional picture. And we hear that a lot, like trying to get that in place. I guess it kind of touches on the proprietary nature. You know, if we know exactly the origin, destination, what the commodity is, you kind of know who's involved. Mm -hmm. It can be, yeah. Any other? Yes. Yeah, sorry if I missed it. Um, what was the source of the commodity data? TransSearch. TransSearch. Yeah. Is, is that, um, it's not open source, I'm guessing, right? It's, uh, no. Yeah, a, they okay. bought it. It's yeah. very expensive, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's very high resolution yeah. commodity data. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. I okay. know uh, when we did the, Mar the first Maryland freight plan in 2009, the state had bought it. It's so expensive. The state had bought it in 2003, and uh, the plan was done in 2009. And we ended up factoring it because <laughs> we couldn't afford it. Yeah. So um, that is a challenge if you don't have uh, the money to buy the data. You know. Thank you. Any other? Yes. Um, has there been any impact evaluation reports on any of these uh, partners you work with, like in Maryland, for instance? Impact evaluation. Like performance measurement. Like what you know? What effects has it had on the operations of the DOC? Has there been any? Uh, evaluation published or anything like that? No formal evaluation. I can tell you more about the Maryland truck parking tool when we, when we get there next. Um, there have been some really good use cases that have come out of using it that I can, that I'll, that I'll touch on. This one is new. We just came out with this in uh, April, I think. This came out in April. And since then, um, TxDOT has had two big uh, corridor events kind of come up and they were like can the tool help us you know and they're kind of learning how to use this and so we've been teaching them and showing and I mean there's not really too much to learn but they've been getting in there like yes this is great because like for example I don't I hope I'm not speaking out of turn but there's an effort to turn six, uh, US 69 into an interstate so this was able to help provide a lot of intel on the commodities that are flowing and how important it is to the economy in Texas and to and the reach and so they were able to look at the different commodities and understand um, how they had like a, a nationally significant impact and so they've been able to get that kind of intel by using this so there's been a few of those uh, where they've like yes this is exactly what I need and we've had a couple consultants who are like this is great and so that's why we're adding that button where you can click on a particular corridor and it spits out the numbers so that consultants can use them in their reports or their plans or their studies so uh, that's that's all I have for that right now thank you do you have anything else on that one? No. yes Yes. Yes. And so we actually have that project underway. Um, and so we are uh, going to be adding to uh, some information on rail is notoriously hard to get, but we've got some airport data, delay data at the airport related to the air cargo movements. We've got um, the uh, port 
information, the AIS data, and some intermodal type locations. And we're going to be adding some information about not just the roadway delay around those locations, but the actual delay of like the airplanes or the, the ships and being able to provide some indicators um, so you can kind of see the, the trips that go in and out of those locations. What, good? <laughs> All right. wanting a forecast yeah. yes yeah and we are i think what this has done is opened up like the questions you're asking it has opened up a pandora's box of like oh look at all the cool things we can do and so now it's been like yes let's get there and so we we are i think um that's next on the horizon is how can is is adding that kind of stuff to this and adding new bells and whistles and being able to add a forecasting so you could click on it and get the you know what is this going to look like in the future kind of thing and the other thing i'll add is um our team at tti has been working for federal highway to uh, make a new faf and vehicle inventory and use visualization and it's going through clearance now i guess it'll be out i uh, hope in a couple months depending on how long it takes to clear but um, there's some forecasted information in there as well so we've been able to visualize like th what faf shows is forecasted but if we can do um, something more with this and the roadway data and the transearch data um, I, don't know, I see an I guess what I'm trying to say is I see an opportunity to bring a lot of that information together to show what it's co it might look like in the future and use a couple of different data sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm real excited to come back to you all with when we get the resiliency stuff in there. And then, like, if we can get some forecast, maybe we could pilot with them some forecasting stuff and see if we can't get that in there. And because I, but that's what's happening. We got this up, and now it's like, all right, let's do all the, all the cool stuff. And, and so it takes a little time to get there, but we're working on it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, let me answer you in reverse. Um, so yes, tra t Texas only had 2015 TransSearch. So when we started out, that's what we had. They just bought a new one, so we're updating that. And so the new version of this, I hope, will be available in a couple months as we get the data updated. So we'll just keep the old stuff in there, but then have have the new. <clears throat> so that's part of that. Um, and so I don't know. Um, I don't know. Do you want to take this one about forecasting with TransSearch? <laughs> No, okay. <laughs> Dave? No, I think there's, there's there, I, I can see several different opportunities there. Um, you've got, you've got, in fast, it's done some high level things. You've got um, traffic information that has a, a forecast to it. Uh, you can tie uh, goods movement numbers to truck ADPs and whatever else. And if, if and so you can get some ballpark numbers that are obviously wrong, but they're probably more right based on on the using other traditional forecasted things than to just take some wild guess at things. So basing it on some things we kind of know. So I think there's ways that we could we could do a, maybe a five year. Even though it's beyond that, who knows what what the world economy is going to look like in ten years. So uh, there's things to do there, and I think what's the next question? Borders and ports. And borders, yeah. yeah. So borders, we do have. So as part of our fluidity work with. Um, TxDOT, we did do a border fluidity analysis, and we have um, this spreadsheet tool where you can adjust, or you can see all the, you can click on different border locations and get some information about the delay, and it, we give you a suite of measures. That's one thing I'm, I'm hoping we can add to this in some way. We just started, this is, we're kind of walking, and now I can see, like all these ideas we're running, uh, but uh, we have that. We have done a lot of work on border fluidity, so I'm hopeful that as we, 
fold in the port, the airport. We can add also add in the border. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I forgot to say that we do have the border fluidity information, and you'll be able to get some indicators at a glance of like what's going on at the at the border. I anticipate like you could see the roadway, you can see where it's red, and then at the border, if the delay for whatever time period you've selected, you would see some visual indicator of it being like the the level of delay or something similar at the port. Um, and then the mode share, I think um, when we're finished, we're currently working on this multimodal, the multimodal aspect. And so part of that isn't just showing the delay at those locations, it's also a sensitivity analysis of um, what happens, you know, like not forecasting, but kind of like looking at those modal splits and the, and the shares. And so that, uh, I don't have, uh, I have a team member who's deeply involved in that, and I don't have all the details on exactly how that works, but I could, I could share that with you at some point. Um, but that is part of what we're looking at too. So I hope that answers. I know. All right. I'm going to move on. Any other questions? Burning questions? Okay. Well, huh? yeah, there were great questions. Thank you. And I look forward to your feedback. Like, you know, I'm not up here trying to show you my cool tool and, or our cool tool. And, I, you know, we want this to work. Um, I, I like to say, if I do my job right, I'll work myself out of a job because I want this to work. Like, I want TechStot to use this. I want the public sector to get, a lot. and I can't, like I said, I come from being one of them, and it's like you want it to be super simple, easy, and get them the finger, your stuff at their fingertips, and that's important. So I would really love your feedback. All right, moving on, and I'm sorry you have to listen to me so long. We probably should put Dave in the middle. Um, I'm going to talk to you about truck parking. So everybody's like, ugh, truck parking. <laughs> um, Truck parking is an interesting topic, um, and truck parking has been one of the a very critical freight problem for a long time. And what we mean by truck parking, if you're not familiar with the with the issue, is that there's a lot of trucks on the road. They have to rest. They need to rest, and they need places to do that. But there's not enough parking locations for the trucks to rest. And so we all depend on goods. We go to Target or Macy's, whatever we do, and buying our stuff, and we expect it to be there. And, you know, most of the time, a good moves by truck at some point in its supply chain journey. Um, and there's a lot of trucks on the road. And as, I, as the economy grows and there's more and more demand, um, during COVID, we all purchased from Amazon. We caused more trucks on the road, more trucks that needed rest. And so truck parking is one of those issues where it's like, wow, uh, we, we need this. We need truck parking. Where do we put it? And then I don't know about you, but even though I'm a big supporter of trucks and truck movement and truck parking and I'm trying to solve the issue I don't want truck parking next to my house you know so like it's really hard to locate truck parking a lot of communities don't want it um, so it has become a big uh, part of the recent uh, bipartisan infrastructure law and there's a lot of requirements that state study truck parking but even going back a few surface transportation laws truck parking was uh, it was very present and fast fast and extremely present in MAP 21. And in MAP 21, uh, there was a requirement that USDOT study truck parking. It was called Jason's Law. And I was at USDOT at the time, so I managed that study at the time. And it was named for a truck driver who was trying to find parking, heard from another driver that he could park in an abandoned gas station lot in South Carolina. And he ended up getting murdered. Um, and it, it wasn't safe for him. And so his wife... She, with no political experience, kind of very from a very rural town in North, uh, uh, New York, got with her local, her congressman, and they were able to, with the help of groups like the Real Women in Trucking and some other grassroots, gra gra I can't talk anymore, grassroots truck trucking groups, they came to Capitol Hill and they got Jason's Law passed in MAP 21, which required, which really put a focus on the issue at USDOT. At USDOT, and it uh, re you know required USDOT to look at it. It, it helped make truck parking an eligible uh, eligible for funding and and so forth. Um, the issue is growing though. We still haven't. It's really hard to solve. Nobody wants truck parking. Um, there's funding for it, but it it you know how where does it fall within a DOT's priorities? Like I talked about earlier. 
So a lot of states and MPOs and others have done truck parking studies. And Maryland did a truck parking study, and it was beautiful. And it, and it looked at, it showed here's all the areas of demand. Um, and they had used NREX data to try to identify clusters of demand. Um, but when they were finished with the study, they had tried to use trucker path data to um, understand capacity, uh, where their lots in Maryland were full. And the trucker path data seemed promising, but when they, were, when they got the study done, they realized they couldn't actually use that data at a particular facility. Trucker path is a company that collects data um, crowdsourced from truckers. And they do have information on where lots are full or empty, but um, in the Maryland truck parking study, they could only show it as um, the highway segment nearby was red, yellow, or green, depending on availability at nearby locations. So that really didn't get them the usage information that they were seeking. So uh, they said, Nicole, what can you do? Can you guys get together and maybe use this NREX data that we have to do something to tell us about usage at our facilities? And so I just kind of want to back up a little bit and, and say that, you know, here's the state DOT. They don't have a lot of money to buy lots of data or, or lots of stuff. Um, they have NREX data, and it was like, can you find value in this? Is there something you can do with this that's going to help tell the story? There's some other data sets out there, like Atri or whatnot, that people are using to measure or to look at truck parking. But Maryland's like, I have all this data. I'm getting it every month. And um, they just bought two year more years of it. So um, they use it for lots of different things. So like, please help us figure out if we can use this. Um, and so that's what we did. I want to point out um, that until then, though, uh, the, a lot of the information that they had was very static. And um, like you may not be real interested in the topic of truck parking, a lot of elected officials are like, I hate the trucks. Get them out of here. I, my constituents don't want them. I don't want to hear. I don't, don't even come to me with a truck parking project. So this data has really been useful in engaging elected officials, and I'll stop in a little later, I'll tell you why. Um, <clears throat> but we've been able to use this data to analyze and visualize demand, showing where trucks are parking by different durations, looking at where they're parking where they should be and where they really are, it's not official or where they shouldn't be, looking at the ripple effects of freight generators, where's the truck parking impact, looking at usage, capacity for actual facilities, and identifying different opportunities, marrying the parking data with geospatial data, uh, looking at emergency parking. And also, we've been able to experiment a little bit in how we can use the historical data to turn it into a feed to tell truckers that you're likely not to find parking at a particular location. So this all resulted in a tool, and I'm going to get there. All right. So the first thing, this was the original, like, Take the NREX data and just map it. Show me where the trucks are parking. So we did that, and we sliced it and diced it by delivery, resting, and overnight. And uh, this was particularly useful because at the time we did this, it was 2018, and Baltimore County, Maryland, passed a truck parking ban. They, they were like, these trucks are parked in our residential areas. There's so many of them. Get out. We're going to fine you. You can't be here. And it was a real problem because they have, uh, I think in Maryland's not unique to this, there's, this is probably the case in many states, but there's a lot of residential, inappropriate land use planning, residential uh, industrial mixes some places. And so you have some of these industries up against neighborhoods um, that typically house the workforce, especially in older types of industries that you see in, in the Northeast. Um, so this information, when we sat down with Baltimore County, uh, they looked at that and they couldn't believe that they had, they were like, wow, we didn't realize these trucks are supporting our businesses and we need to do something about this. So we were able to zoom in very granular for them and give them some intel and it helped change the discussion. And they went from get all the trucks out, ban them, to, all right, let's try to find some places for these trucks to park so they're not parked in our residential areas. Uh, 
After that, it was like, okay, can we geofence actual parking and can this data tell us about the usage of a particular parking space? So where you see green is uh, we geofence, that's where they should be parking. And then the rest of it is uh, ramps, and or ramps and shoulders where you don't really want the trucks because that's not a safe spot for them, even in truck only parking locations. Uh, trucks are slow and they don't do well getting on and off the roadway and that is where we see a lot of crashes the ingress and egress and so you want to reduce that and have them parked in actual official safe spots so uh, i won't get too far into this but we were able to graph where the trucks were using the raw NREX data by time of day, and we had three months of data we were working with, so uh, we, we were able to see kind of the patterns by different types of parkers, the short term and then the overnight, and those parking in the official spaces and those uh, parking on the ramps and shoulders. The data can also be used to show origins and destinations. So if you have a particular issue at a f parking facility, where you have a lot of trucks um, that are parked on ramps, uh, this data can help show you know, your short-term parkers, they're coming from these destinations and then they're going on up to New York and they're pulling into this particular facility, they're parking for like 30 minutes, um, but they're parking in unofficial locations. And so this helps a DOT, the operator say, okay, maybe we need like a short term in and out parking lot or some sort of auxiliary opportunity to help the truckers find um, something so they're not creating some safety problems by parking on ramps and shoulders. Uh, I will say that we, we tried to check um, the NRICS data against some manual accounts that Maryland had. The manual accounts that Maryland had were, were pretty bad. They were one day, one to two days a year um, from 11 o'clock at night or four in the morning. It really wasn't painting a good picture. We did check them. We got, I mean, it, this isn't terribly defensible, but we got pretty close. We liked the, the NRIX numbers once we analyzed them seemed pretty good. We got checked them with the state DOT district staff, and they were like, yeah, that, that seems about right based on what we observe in terms of usage and be things being over capacity. So the data seemed to tell a pretty defensible story. Um, but uh, then MDOT said, okay, put it in a dashboard. We'd like to see it, we have all this data. Can you do it some, so that it updates all the time? And we would love to be able to um, interact with the data. So we built this dashboard, the truck parking visualization tool. Um, we're still kind of working on some of the cosmetic features of it, but the, the inf intel that Maryland wanted is here. You can go to a statewide section or region section, or you can look at the actual parking sites. I have this set to January 2021. Uh, you can see at a glance what the clusters of parks, parking look like for trucks across the state. Um, you can, one thing I like about the NRICS data that you can't do with the other data sets is that you can uh, differentiate between weight classes. So you can see weight class uh, two, which is like your medium uh, delivery types of trucks. And then you can see the weight class three trucks and what that parking looks like. Um, so you can get it and then you can change it for different months. Uh, you can also select if you only wanna see those that park them less than one hour and it takes a little while to load because there's a lot of data behind it, but you can choose different time bins. It's got a whole bunch of statistics. So if you're from a DOT and you need to report on the um, IAJA requirements, this has everything. Um, months, uh, it's got like when, what months are most busy, days of the week, hours, a breakdown of your parking by duration, and you can get a lot of, I mean, there's all kinds of things in here. Um, there's different charts and graphs, um, and uh, you can, like I said, you can split it by weight class. This down here, I like, this is kind of a new thing we added. We found that even though the data are counts and NRICS counts change month to month, you can't look at this as like a trend line. But we did put this graph in because we wanted to see if we could identify any kind of um, events in the data. And we found that when you look at 2020, that you see that dip. Um, 
uh, that's co the COVID period. And so you could see like when Maryland went out of service in March, like around March 15th, 2020, and then when Maryland went back in, when the governor came out and said, okay, you're all free to go out and about, that was somewhere around May something or other, I can't remember. Um, and so you can see kind of these different things happening. So this was something new we added. This probably needs a little more research, but we put it in here anyway, because it, it's more food for thought. Um, you can zoom in and get very granular, kind of like that other map I showed you. And so this shows all of the parking except less than one hour. You can, if I add it in, the, the delivery parking takes over. I think there's a lot more uh, of the, or the short-term parking, not the delivery, so to speak. Um, there's a lot more of that in Maryland than some of the other overnights. But you can take this, you can select what you want. And I have a land use layer underneath of it. So um, green is agriculture, but yellow is low density residential and orange is medium density residential. And you can see that there's quite a number of trucks parked in some of these residential areas. This is DC, by the way, or the DC region. Um, you can, and that, and that has been useful in discussions with local governments and MPOs because you can say, look, you know, here's where you have concentrations of these trucks parking in residential areas and let's find some solutions. Let's not be punitive, but let's find some solutions. Uh, this is the parking sites part. And so I have uh, the Maryland house, which is up on I-95. So if you drive from here up to New York, you probably stop there. The green is where trucks should be parking and everywhere else is where they shouldn't be. And um, this provides some numbers of the official counts. And again, we're using the raw counts um, from INRIX. Uh, we calculate, so we, and we provide those. We calculate what's called an unofficial rate. And that's the ratio of trucks parked on ramps and shoulders to all the trucks parked there. And what's critical about that as a former DOT person if I have a lot of trucks parked, if I have a high number of trucks parked on ramps and shoulders, but I don't have many um, in, the, in the actual location where they should be, that tells me the truckers aren't using the spaces. And then I can go in and I can observe why. It might be, a lot of people think truck parking is a one size fits all thing, it's not. Trucks, you know, what a refrigerated truck can fit in one kind of space, but a car carrier cannot. So in Maryland, we have a lot of roll-on, roll-off freight um, at the port. It's one of the top ports for row row freight. It's what they call it. And so we have a lot of car carriers or tractor carriers or truck carriers. And so maybe they're the ones coming from someplace. The, perhaps the intermodal facility in um, Front Royal, Virginia, and they're getting the cars or the trucks or the tractors, and they're bringing them up to the port of Baltimore, um, and they're stopping at a particular location and they but they can't fit in the lot where you know they're the the turning radii are too difficult so this kind of information gives you as a dot person the intel to say i got to go check this out i got to see this with my own eyes and figure out what's going on um down here uh it's kind of presenting a little funny on my computer and i apologize but there's a we have some expansion factors we provide an expansion factor um, to try to, if you wanted to uh, see what the actual population of trucks might be. Uh, but in this case, uh, there's 55 parking spaces and then the average daily total is 69. What we tend to see with the data are that for many of Maryland's locations, there's like 55 spaces, 21 spaces, and way more trucks there at any given hour than they actually have spaces for. So um, this data helps us see just how over capacity they are. And here's a whole bunch of other statistics. One thing, uh, one last thing I wanna mention um, about this is, it, this is data, it's a sample, it's not perfect. Um, ground truthing is something Maryland's trying to do just to try to make sure they have some counts, but man getting manual counts, sending people out to do manual counts is very expensive and can present safety problems. Another option is, is sensors. Um, you can outfit all kinds of sensors and cameras, but that costs a bunch of money and you have to maintain it. And when you're competing with other priorities and you can use data in a smarter way to get you pretty close to the information that you need, that is very appetizing for a DOT because if they have to go implement or outfit all of their facilities with um, cameras and sensors and then they have to maintain it, um, that's a big expense and it requires somebody to do that. That means another job. and um, 
some states have a lot of money, but I know Maryland is one of those states that, you know, every dollar is stretched. And so if you are adding the cost, you know, eventually they want to outfit everything as part of like CAV and, and all that. But for now, they can get pretty good intel about the truck parking problem and be able to work with elected officials by seeing the data way cheaper than spending millions on those types of systems. So until that happens. All right, a uh, couple other th things, and then I'll take questions. But um, let me go back to this really quick. Next steps for us is looking at some of the... Um, all right, I won't talk. Well, one of the things we've done in Maryland is we've layered in where the state owns property, and we've done a suitability analysis by trying to figure out if uh, we applied some criteria to see if it could support parking. And uh, we colored the sites green, yellow, or red, depending on if they made good options. And this is Maryland's excess property that State Highway has along the right of way. Um, so we've been able to layer it with the with the NRIX data and kind of see where we had some opportunities maybe to uh, offload some state property, like through a public-private partnership, um, to develop some parking. We've done a lot of work uh, looking at safety data. I know this is a busy slide, but there's a lot of things going on here. We've done some suitability analytics, um, looked at safety data and some other things by um, layering and matching data together. I won't talk about this because I want to keep moving, but it's been very useful to have this information as part of Maryland's outreach to local governments and MPOs about what's going on. We compared the data to look at um, whether or not it could make a good data feed that you could send out to truckers and say, yeah, this, uh, you know, historically, based on this data, this lot is, is full at this hour. And the truckers, uh, we did a study through the UTC for safety, and we found that truckers felt that that kind of intel would still be useful for them so they could consider it um, or pass up on it if, if it was historically over capacity. This here, um, the latest that we're adding in to this tool is looking at a ripple effect of parking. We geofence a particular freight generator, in this case, Alliance Texas, and we look at the trucks where they stopped just prior to going to Alliance and where they went after they stopped and made a delivery. And it was really eye-opening to see the corridors light up, and it gave us a sense of where these trucks are coming from, where they parked just prior to a freight generator, and then where they went. And I think the key message here is, wow, this truck parking issue is not just a local thing. It has a reach all the way across Texas. And so this helps to identify that different freight generators have different reaches and different impacts. So if you're going to build a big industrial facility like Alliance or Trade Point Atlantic, for those of you who might be local up in Baltimore, and you're going to have millions of square footage of you know new industrial facilities, you're looking at an impact like this, uh, potentially. And you can use this data to help kind of understand what that's going to look like and how you might need to build truck parking way out to support the truckers who are going to be supporting your new facility. All right, and then we've used the data to look at emergency truck parking, like what happened before, during, and after a storm. This was in Imelda in Texas in 19. Uh, you, we could see we could see movement, and so we're adding this in for TxDOT. We're looking at different disruptive events, whether they're storms or even big concerts or like uh, South by Southwest, and we can see what happens to truck parking and where we might need to identify emergency truck parking when events occur or have auxiliary lots available or identified so that operators can be like, storms coming, truckers, you can park over here, you know, like and, and make sure that they know that that's available. All right, so um, that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you, but we've got a lot going on with visualizing truck parking. I think it's going a long way to really help conversations with people and make it real for people. Uh, it's a very difficult subject and uh, multifaceted, and I think that these things um, can help bring people together on this topic, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Five minutes for questions. Yep. Yes. And also the difficulty of you know, convincing folks that, that they need uh, or that the truck parking has value. Um, has, has truck crashes been used as a way to say that this section of roadway can be safer if the trucks were not parking in this particular location? You know, parking you know, illegally in locations you know, provide uh, safer truck, 
truck parking so that to show that there's there's sort of general advantages to all users? Uh, I think I understand. Uh, we. I hope I answer your question correctly. We just did this work for the University Transportation Center for safety, the disruptive technologies and safety. And one of the elements of it was a, a, a literature search on research on the, um, the because we always hear that truck parking is a huge safety problem and that it's it's an issue, and, and but we couldn't find any research that directly said because this trucker didn't have safe parking there was this cra this crash occurred and one of the big challenges that I noted when I worked on the first Jason's law and the second one is that law enforcement codes crashes differently there's there's inconsistency about how they code the crashes and so that's a problem too so we don't have really strong data crash data that says because of this then that um, however, there are some other studies that, that talk about like tire drivers or, or high crash locations and things like that. Um, as part of the work that we did, we did map um, the high crash locations uh, and looked at the data where the truckers were trying to park. And we did find um, some of those clusters that there had been a lot of crashes around those clusters where the trucks were parking, whether it was an authorized spot or unauthorized so you do see not so much in the actual lots but when they're kind of around so we did whoa, we did overlay that information but it's it wasn't terribly rigorous and I haven't seen any really good rigorous studies that have made that connection real well just anecdotal is that kind of answer perfectly okay <laughs> thank you good anybody else yes Yes, yeah, so we spent some time looking at the data to try to identify the right boundaries to put on it, and that was a concern. And there's still some things we're seeing in the data that we have to investigate a little bit, um, f like uh, ad hoc, in an ad hoc kind of way, like, oh, okay, that looks like it might be something related to the Social Security Center or something and unique to them. Like, so we're seeing different behaviors that, you know, that we have to check out from time to time. Uh, we ended up uh, cutting it off at 15 minutes and up and then putting into the different time bins after playing around with the different sensitivities. And we felt that that helped us see um, or good groupings. We're definitely open to feedback on that. But after looking at it and playing with it and exploring it, that seemed to be the best, the best bins uh, to put them in, you know, 15 and up, so we could exclude all those delivery trips. Yes. Last question. Yeah, last question. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. Okay. Um, one thing I was just curious about when you were talking about ground truth thing, especially in port areas, you may have uh, the trucks leaving chassis with containers, either bare or with a container on it. So somewhere, did you encounter any of that stuff in the ground truth against the NREX data that there, there was, you had a space taken by a chassis or a truck container, but there was no truck there, so was it being reported by the NREX data? Yeah, we didn't, so um, we didn't have what it was that the, so we didn't do the ground true thing. We used the, um, the counts that somebody else did over the past decade or so, and they didn't mark what it was. So um, they didn't say that it was like a full truck or it was just a chassis or something that was pinging. Um, unfortunately, going forward, that is something that we need to note. Like, what was it? Was it just part of it? I will tell you, when I worked for Federal Highway and I managed the freight performance program, I had the ATRI data contract. And if you're not familiar with ATRI, it's the American Transportation Research Institute. And um, they have a heavy, primarily heavy truck data set that people have used. And Federal Highway used to get it and run performance measures on it in the past. They don't anymore. They use the NREX data. Um, it did show, like, it was picking up, sometimes it was picking up only components of things. So it wasn't actually a truck. It was just a chassis or it was a container that... And so there were some and the analytics, and I'm sorry if I'm kind of like slow on the answer. I'm just kind of going back 10 years here. There were some analytics where you could, 
you know, it's like, what is that? Oh, and you'd see a, a, when you mapped all the, the pings, it was like over the, the, the Gulf of Mexico. And you're like, well, what is that? No trucks go, driving over there. And it was ended up being containers or a truck that had been put on a ship or something like that. So I don't know if I'm getting to your question real well. But yes, there are problems like that. And it's important to, to be checking to see what, what it might have been. Yeah. cell phone, whether they're tracking the in-dash system or whatever the case may be. In the truck, they're usually tracking the GPS unit that's on top of the cab it's almost all the time. All right, Nicole, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for not one but two presentations. That's amazing. Um, and you know how Chipotle has like a secret menu? Well, so does TRB. <laughs> Uh, he wasn't on the program, but he's here now. This is David Schrenk. He is also with uh, TTI. He's a senior research scientist at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. He has been involved with urban mobility, freight mobility, and performance management research for over 30 years. Let's hear it for Dave. Woo! <laughs> all right, we're going to slow down after all that parking and, and freight visualization. Um, so. I'm going to take a, take a step back here. Nicole kind of set the stage for how we got to where she's at, and I'm going to set that stage here too. I, I didn't do that in the slides, but I think it's probably a good idea. Um, some of you may have heard of the Urban Mobility Report that TTI produces. Um, it's been around since the late 80s. In the early years, um, we, and it's kind of embarrassing now, but we estimated the heck out of congestion in the U.S. Uh, with all, with starting with just a few traffic counts. Um, and in 2007, our world changed when we started getting this uh, probe data from a company called Enrix. And actually we had HERE data, or Navtech at that time, or Nokia actually at that time, then it was Navtech, then it was HERE. But um, all this probe data became available and it absolutely changed our world for traffic congestion. Um, and what it has allowed us to do, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a few of these, these products. Um, we, in Texas, we started with this urban mobility report. Um, the legislature went to TxDOT in 2009 and said, um, we'd like to make sure that we're spending our money where our mouth is. So can you tell us if you're actually dealing with some of the worst locations in the state of Texas for traffic? TxDOT said, oh, anecdotally, yeah, we can. So they turned to us and said, okay, please um, take what you know and, and can you go out and find these locations, track them, and, and report annually in to the legislature on how we're doing. So that was the birth of the Texas 100 Most Congested Road Sections, which has been around, like I said, since 2009. Um, and uh, we produced that. That's an annual update of about 10,000 centerline miles of road in the state of Texas that we track. Most of it, obviously it's in the urban areas, uh, probably about 85% of it is in the, the four big metros in the state. So um, that has created a lot of things and it's led to kind of where we're at on some of this truck uh, work because again, the congestion information caught some eyes and it kind of got people thinking about how we're using this probe data and it's kind of led to some other things. So, uh, let's see. Oh, let's try a different tact here. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start kind of the evolution a little bit about how, what we're doing today to look at truck congestion in both Texas and in, in Maryland, uh, as Nicole was alluding to. Talk about a few of the things along that path um, try not to hit on some of the same topics necessarily that you just heard. Uh, we have two tools in Texas that have come out of the Texas 100 analysis, the TCAT, the truck congestion analysis tool. We also have Compact, which is taking that congestion information 
and providing it straight to the MPOs to use in their CMP processes. So they can now track segments annually and update their numbers with, without ever leaving their offices by just using this database. Uh, and then the, the MRPT tool is a lot like the Texas um, truck or truck congestion analysis tool. Some people just say Texas congestion analysis tool, but um, in, in that and some of the things you'll see. So I want to start with kind of the throwback here. Um, we get all excited about all this probed speed data and all this OD information and whatever, but honestly, our analysis starts with truck counts. Um, and, and do we have a good truck count out on the road? And so, for example, this um, um, map you see here came out of the TCAT tool, and it's simply going out and showing where this is Travis County, Austin, and you can see I-35 there in red in the middle of the screen. Um, but a lot of times, if you have good truck count information, you, you can tell about two-thirds or three-quarters of the story that's needed with, without going any further. Because obviously, where there's trucks, you're going to have truck congestion probably. You're going to have a lot of value in those trucks, so that commodity. So anyway, really, it starts with truck counts, and everything you add from that is just kind of another, another chapter in the book to give you a little bit more information, a little more clarity. So I mentioned the Urban Mobility Report. Um, this is like a, a snapshot of a page. This is, if you zoomed in, I think this is Houston. Um, these are some of the statistics that we track in that. And you see the lower left is all the truck statistics. But what um, this kind of captures a lot of people's attention and says, what can we do? What can we do um, now that we can, if we can do this, for Texas, we can do, actually do this for the U.S. We can do this for Texas and Houston. You know, what can we do at a uh, at a, a localized level? And so that led us to again the the congestion tools that we have. So I mentioned Texas 100 most congested road sections. There's 1,800 sections, uh, about 10,000 centerline miles. We began tracking trucks in that in 2014 when um, Enric said, oh yeah, we can split truck speeds out from the all from the all vehicle mix so that we can have an idea about our, our trucks performing, uh, is truck performance different than what you would get with the all, all vehicle mix? And so what you see here on the left is, those are the top 100 sections lit up in, uh, for trucks in the state, uh, starting up with Dallas and Houston in the, in the lower left or right hand corner and then on down through Austin and San Antonio and then on the right we've zoomed into the Houston area and so you're seeing corridors there again this is truck congestion and so you know, it takes two things for truck congestion slow speeds and a lot of trucks those things together is why I-45 lights up why I-10 lights up why 610 around uh, Houston lights up and on and on and on 288 that goes down to the port at Freeport. There's not just the port of Houston. There's a port of Freeport right beside it And of course Beaumont here on the east side lots of ports within a small area um, there so again Going back to we've got all this information. We've got this. This is for example the the website So when I zoom into Houston, here's all the the Houston metro area statistics for truck congestion Again, lighting up, actually all delay, truck delay, and lots of other statistics. And underneath that, you have all the various sections of road ranked. And so you can see where are my truck problems in a Houston area um, zoomed in. Here's, that, here's, a, here's a, same, a, a different example. This is Baltimore County. So we don't have Baltimore it's, itself lit up, but the, the rest of the county. And, and for example, this isn't delay, this isn't traffic delay, which is what we typically start most of our, our congestion analyses with, delay, and in the case of bottlenecks, delay per mile, so we can compare a section of road that's two miles with one that's five miles, because it's normalized. And what this is, is the planning time index. So this is unreliable traffic. So you see reds or oranges up here, that means there's a lot of volatility in the congestion on any given day. A lot of times that's linked to incidents and other things like maybe even weather, depending on where you're at in the, uh, in the country. So again, on and on and on, more, more visuals, uh, truck congestion and road segments. 
So this is uh, Austin again. Um, and so this is the C, I mentioned the, the compact tool, the CMP. This allow, or actually this is, yeah, this is, no, this is clean temple. I'm sorry. Um, I knew I'd, I've got all kinds of mixes in here. Again, a small MPO in Texas using this to populate their CMP report that has to go into the federal highway. And you can see where their uh, area lights up for congestion, even uh, in the clean temple area, which houses Fort Hood and, and a lot of um, uh, military cargo traffic in and out of that area. So it is a, a huge, um, if you look at I-35 through Texas, the, the odd thing is it lights up around Clean Temple because that is where the highest truck counts are uh, along I-35, which is, which is it's oftentimes kind of makes you scratch your head until you think about what's happening there. Um, keep going. Now, so we have this truck information. We have truck OD information from Enrix now that, we, that TxDOT purchases. So now what we did is the worst bottleneck for truck traffic in the state of Texas is downtown Austin I-35. That's the highest truck delay. So we said, okay, show us all the O's and D's that go through that segment on a given day. What's that, again, you were talking about the market shed of that particular section of road. And you can see here, it's starting down in Laredo there with that bottom left-hand yellow and going all the way up through Dallas-Fort Worth and, and, and out of, of Texas. Um, and you can see what's contributing to that delay. This isn't an Austin situation. This is a Texas situation and Austin, actually um, U.S., the number of trucks coming through there. We stop here at the border, obviously, because we can get OD information that goes way beyond. Um, here is another look at, if I zoom in on that north end of that, I just want to look at what's, what's contributing out of the DFW Metroplex area in those same graphics you just saw. You can see some of that, that green area there on the north side is that Alliance Airport area that Nicole was showing in one of her examples. Uh, and there's some industrial and, and warehousing areas lighting up in red and blue there uh, around the, uh, the Fort Worth area. So it makes sense. But then you can see, okay, that piece of section road in Austin for trucks is, is a big deal for the state of Texas economy because we're talking about marrying up Laredo, Dallas-Fort Worth, and, and beyond to the state. Another thing we get out of that useful OD information, we can kind of get an idea about vehicle profile for the day. When are more vehicles going through sections of road? This is I-35W through Fort Worth. It's a, it's a top five bottleneck in the state. And you can see there, I mean, what you see with truck traffic is typically about five, six in the morning, truck traffic picks up until about seven, eight at night. You have this sort of single camel hump kind of effect all day long because you have the, the through long trips happening and then you add regional and local deliveries and things happening. So you can see that in the data and it can help to tell the story or it can help to potentially drive a solution. Um, you saw this graphic earlier, but adding the commodities to this, when we're talking about that, uh, that um, you know, I-35 being the biggest bottleneck for trucks in the state, uh, you can start, again, seeing this pattern of all up from Laredo up, you know, taking a right turn there in Dallas and going to Texarkana, which ties into Little Rock, Memphis, and beyond. If you actually take this, you can see these truck trips going all the way to Memphis. Uh, and so it is, it's, it is a, by putting commodity values here, you can again, not only is it a lot of hours of delay, but there's a lot of value in what's being delayed. Um, here's an example of, again, Baltimore County uh, using the FAF data as opposed to um, uh, the trans search in Texas. And you can see again, I think Nicole had something similar to this, that I-95 coming up out of Baltimore area heading up um, what toward Philly or whatever up that way is some of the most valuable commodity uh, movement in the in the in the region. Um, I saw earlier we were talking about truck project or projects lighting up on the screen. One of the things we do in our TCAT Compact tools um, is to tie it in with Texas's Unified Transportation Plan, 
There's about 12,000 projects or something in that plan. And so when you're sitting here looking at truck problems or, or truck delay in this, you can bring up the projects and go, okay, there's a project there. Is that truck related? Is that gonna help us out? Or is that a, just a pavement repair or is it what? And you can start, start looking at what's already planned and programmed and is that going to help trucks or not? As opposed to spending a lot of time thinking uh, and wasting time because there's already a, a solution that's coming two or three years down the road. One of the things that all of this data leads us to, you'll, if, if you've been around enough of these conferences, you've heard me talk about Tostada. Tostada is a great visual. It, we call, it's, the, it's the tool for stack data. And, it, and when you start talking about layering this data, if you take a bite through it at any given time, you get all the flavors. So in this case, you get all the elements of the data elements feeding in to a potential solution. So one of the things, for example, I'm, I'm going to show this graphic and then I'm going to back up a little bit. The second from the left here, this is I-45 going from Houston to Dallas. And if you take a look at, at traffic congestion and then commodity value, and you look at, you know, sort of light up what, what's my problem area, you see obviously Houston. From almost from all the way from Galveston to the north side of Houston lighting up with a lot of value in the commodities and a lot of truck congestion. So if that's all you're focused on, that's what lights up on that corridor. But you can also see, okay, if I want to change it to go, okay, what's the economic value of this, of this piece of, uh, or, or this corridor, along that corridor, it lights up differently. If you go to the far right, um, you know, if you just look at um, congestion, delay, and other things, you even start getting some of the rural areas showing up because what you're getting there is truck stops. You're getting some inter interchanges with U.S. highways and things where there's a lot of slow moving. You mentioned it's hard for trucks to decelerate and accelerate. Well, that happens every time they enter and exit the road, and that happens a lot of these major interchanges with other, um, these, some of these red spots here in the middle of the state. That's a U.S. highway that just happens to go to a Walmart distribution center that's about 50 miles east of I-45. So there's reasons for it, and these, these numbers actually show that. So again, backing up to Tostada, the idea would be you take congestion data, you take um, truck commodity data, you take pavement information, you take bridge condition, you take all these things, you layer them up and you use that to make decisions from because all that data can help talk to each other and give you um, what, what may be the, the, the indicator for what your solution might be. Uh, and you can weight those differently. Maybe safety is our thing right now. We've got to deal with safety. Safety gets more than its fair share of the weight Congestion has its, trucks has its, or whatever, but you can affect that index and what would come out of Tostada that way. I talk about that because I think that's where all this data can head and where it is actually heading. Some states are getting close to Tostada. The problem is legacy data systems are slowing it down. Pavement, bridge, some of those things have been around forever and they're not on the linear referencing system that the rest of the state's using for most other things. And so it's going to take a while for that transition to happen, but as it happens, we're going to get to a point where we can, um, we can put all these together, keep them together, and be making decisions from all the data we have at our fingertips. So in, in kind of closing, uh, you know, you, all this truck information comes in all shapes and sizes, and it's from something as simple as truck counts. And it, I, I can't harp on... If you're in a DOT, you're in an MPO, you're in an agency that deals with that kind of data, having good truck counts is probably the most important data thing you can have in your data set because it all starts from that. And trying to calibrate, calibrate Nicole's parking information, if she's trying to calibrate it against truck traffic or truck counts that you're not sure about, that makes it more difficult. But if you know that those are pretty darn good then it sure makes that kind of effort trying to look at those parking locations or whatever much more easy because you know that that 10,000 trucks that says are right here, that's the number. So again, that's important. Um, keep in mind, and this came up yesterday, we were meeting with Maryland DOT bef uh, up here, is that getting the information out is the most important. Making it beautiful, 
come second. You know, beautiful, a lot of times we shoot for beautiful on day one. And we spend months trying to get beautiful. We could have had the information out already being used. And I'll say pretty, not beautiful. And so I, I would encourage you as you're doing visualization, you know, was it perf- don't let perfect get in the way of, of pretty darn good. And that's the case with a lot of visualization these days. We can do some really, I've seen some really cool things, and I say, what does that answer? You know, I, I, I'm just like, wow. But does that answer a question that a DOT or a, a policymaker or something has? So I encourage you to think that way and to, and to not necessarily look for beautiful on day one, but look for functional use cases. Does it, does it serve a purpose? And, uh, oh, well, not doing too bad. Um, I think that's it. I've got, I've, I, can, I can go through the slide, uh, the, the TCAT tool or whatever to show you that. You kind of saw screenshots of it. Um, it's, not, it's not beautiful. It's very functional. Uh, and so I, you know, I, we, and, and it is on the, it is live. You, you, you um, go to tcat.tti.tamu.edu um, or compat.tti.tamu.edu. They're live. Um, anybody can see them. Anybody can touch that information. I think Mr. Pat, MRPT dot, is the same thing. So uh, feel free to go and look at those on your own. And you, you can contact us if you have any questions and, um, and, Nicole with the truck parking or any anything really truck heavy, that's Nicole's thing. I'm I'm a traffic congestion guy, um, so I just happen to do truck congestion as well. So questions? That was all clear as mud. <laughs> yeah. So I love what you said about truck truck counts. We have only a very limited number of vehicle class sites. The NRX is a sample. How do we? Well, there is, um, there is, um, there's ways to, to feel better about your data. Um, I, I tell you, you, we all in this room know where it's heading. Um, some places faster than others is that we're going to be getting a lot of our data from private sector in the future. Even our ADTs and truck ADTs and everything else are going to come from that. What we're going to have to do is maintain enough of our traditional equipment in order to make sure that stuff is calibrated. There's been a lot, there's been a, at least one federal highway study and, and okay, several state DOTs are looking into, uh, for example, using NRICs or other providers who can give you ADTs at locations. Um, and I think what TTI was on the, the group that looked at uh, for federal highway, I think Steve Jessberger's group was the one who uh, led that at Federal Highway. Um, and basically, if there's enough vehicles at that location, I think the cutoff was about 5,000 ADT. Anything over 5,000 ADT, the, the numbers were good enough to start looking at. And, and the more, the higher the volumes got, the, the better the, the, the ratio of, of sample to reality got. So I think that there's ways that we're, to look at that to ground truth it, to feel better about it, but that's where we're heading for, for classification data, for ADTs, for truck ADTs, for volume profiles, like I showed you on the screen, all that's coming. Yes, sir. Um, I'm talking about truck parking, there are some pilot projects out there to try to, you know, put in some truck parking and, and show how many spots are left in existing truck parking but it seems like the demand is is growing you know so fast that we should be building more not just doing more demonstration projects and yet then you know aren't they all going to be automated and you won't have to pull over and stop so Can you comment on any yeah. of that well um, so um let me try to connect the Yes, we need more trucking, we need it now. And that's why the data, like for example, in Maryland DOT's case, once they were able to see all the, see it on the map and, and kind of be able to absorb it, one of the challenges is it's not in the DOT's jurisdiction, it's in the local government jurisdiction. 
And so it's like, okay, now I've got to go convince these local government people who are getting constituents complaining about trucks all the time that they need to build truck parking. They don't have the money for it. How are we going to work this out? And so the data are helping to have that those conversations, but it's not happening overnight, and it won't. Um, as far as needing truck parking, what I think is that, uh, based on my work, I also work a lot with automated trucking and connected and automated trucking, and here's what I think. I think that the, the concept of transfer hubs um, that are out there with Ryder, Kodiak, and others, where they're um, trying, when they are buying and have already bought very quietly, um, property along highway right away so they can have property for transferring a, uh, uh, an automated truck to a middle or first to last mile, potentially a human driven truck, robotically driven truck or droid or something, delivery bot. Um, that is happening under the radar. But to me, that's truck parking um, because it's just the new truck parking. And we should be looking at that and having conversations with the CAV world because um, that's the same the same criteria, and, and when, I think when people are going to wake up to what's happening, there's going to be complaints about it because it's like, oh my gosh, look at all this big trucking operation, but it kind of flew under the radar because it's CAV. I don't want to stall that. I'm all for CAV, but I think we need to be having those discussions. So the same property needs, the same issues with um, congestion, uh, turning radii, uh, places for them, I think is... Um, continue as we move to an automated truck. That's, that's my personal opinion. And you, you probably know this number. It's fascinating to, to think about the fact what percentage of trucks are on the road at all times. If they all had to park at the same time, we would be in a world of hurt. It's, is it like uh, 30 to 40 or 50 percent of trucks are always moving or, or at, at any given time because you've got the over, you've got the daytime delivery types but at the same time, you got the national haulers, and you know there's there's some resting, some driving, all that stuff, and and the parking would be so the she showed uh, the tropical storm Esmelda down near Houston Beaumont, you know, 36 to 48 inches of rain in a day. Um, basically, all those trucks parked wherever they were, and you could see immediately the problem. <laughs> um, and there was no place for them, and that that's kind of the big picture here is, you know, that shouldn't ever happen, but what happens if it does? What happens if the East Coast has a problem, uh, tropical storms, whatever the case may be, and, and several states are basically closed down? And it, you're talking about locking things down. So I feel free to contact us about traffic congestion stuff. We're easy to find, uh, and 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 here here's a great resource on anything truck related right here. So, thank you, David and Nicole, for a wonderful conversation about uh, visualizing freight traffic. Uh, that wraps it up for keep on trucking, but keep on trucking. Keep on trucking. We now have a half hour break until the next session. See ya.